Good evening, everyone. Welcome to The Readout. And we begin tonight with major breaking news, a bombshell ruling from the Colorado Supreme Court in just the last hour states that Donald Trump is disqualified from holding the office of president and from appearing on the Republican primary ballot in that state. In a more than 200-page ruling, the court found that Trump is ineligible for the White House under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The court found that the district court was correct in its early ruling, calling the January 6th attack on the Capitol an insurrection, and that Trump, quote, engaged in that insurrection through his personal actions. The court noted, we do not reach these conclusions lightly. We are mindful of the magnitude and weight of the questions now before us. We are likewise mindful of our solemn duty to apply the law without fear or favor and without being swayed by public reaction to the decisions that the law mandates we reach. This frankly stunning and unprecedented decision could have major implications in the 2024 race, in which Trump is currently <clears throat> the Republican frontrunner. The decision will likely be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which could decide the matter on a national level. And when a big news uh, item like this drops, we there's one person we want to talk to more than anybody else. So, of course, Rachel Maddow joins me now on the phone. <laughs> Rachel, we had a whole show planned, my friend, uh, and that is completely <laughs> upended. This is what we're talking about now. I am in front of, festooned with papers in front of me, but I just want to listen to you react to what Colorado's Supreme Court has done. Yeah, Joy, first of all, thank you for having me on. I know it's very short notice, and we're all just trying to absorb this. Um, I mean... Uh, listen, I, I think in the in the broad strokes, in terms of our democracy, there are very few magic wands. <laughs> there are there are very few sort of um, you know magic spells that you cast that um, make a make a complex and difficult problem go away. That just it just doesn't happen very often in our political system, and I think that we shouldn't be under any illusions um, about the the character and the partisan inclinations among other things, of of this current Supreme Court as it is constituted. That said, yeah. it is not it is this is not a crazy thing for a democracy to do. This is mm -hmm. um, this is this is something that was a hallmark of post war Germany uh, after World War Two. This is something that happened to Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil quite recently. This is something that our own Congress did in 1868 after our own civil war, specifically to preclude anybody from holding office in this country who had engaged in insurrection against this country. And so it's it's not unheard of, but it's. It would it would be an incredible wild card. It would indeed. And to your very point, um, you know, uh, there are 14 members who were expelled during uh, the Civil War for supporting the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. The 14th Amendment, Section 3, was written for the Confederacy. It was written because of that insurrection. And I think what was the most stunning to me, Rachel, I haven't gone through this a very, very thick ruling. It's, it's a big stack of paper. But the part that I've gotten through, what, what I found the most stunning is that what this court has said is that the, the, the previous court, the lower court, was not wrong in saying that Donald Trump engaged in insurrection. Their only error was saying that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which, again, was to prevent insurrectionists from serving, didn't apply to presidents. They said, oh, no, we agree with the lower court. He did engage in insurrection, but Section 3 does, in fact, apply to presidents. I guess it was surprising that the lower court said that it didn't. Yeah, I mean, and it's interesting, after that district court ruling, um, the, the Trump side appealed part of it, and the plaintiffs appeared the, appealed the other part of it. <laughs> and so it was a you know, real question as to what the, what the Colorado Supreme Court was going to do here. But, I mean, let's keep in mind the scale of this. So this is about Colorado only. It will, you said it will likely be appealed to the Supreme Court. It will certainly be appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Um, and then their ruling... Um, I mean, depending on what they rule, they could just swat this down and, and, and make this go away. But if they engage with it in a more nuanced way, or if indeed they agree with the findings of the Colorado Supreme Court, then this will be uh, something that has national implications. And um, this, this, will, this will apply in, in, in many states. And so, uh, listen, I, I, I don't think this is the way that Donald Trump's political career ends, ultimately, because 
of what we know about this iteration of the United States Supreme Court. But Mm -hmm. the factual findings about him having engaged in insurrection, as defined technically for the purposes of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, which says insurrectionists cannot hold office in this country, it's not that you can't run for office, it's that you cannot hold office in this country because you have broken your oath. That is a, it's, it's, it's not a flippant decision. They fact, they did fact finding to arrive at that. And it's, it's gonna, it, it's, it's going to matter some way. I, I don't believe it will be a magic wand that, that ends his political career. But um, this is a substantive finding and a, and a real surprise from the Colorado Supreme Court. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's break that down into two pieces. Let's first talk about how, how much it could expand, like how much this could metastasize for Donald Trump, the, the, the worries over Colorado, right? This is not a, a swing state that he would likely win anyway, whatever. But there are other state courts that have already rejected similar lawsuits attempting to keep him off the ballot. And I will name them. Arizona, Michigan, Minnesota. Mm-hmm. The plaintiffs challenging Trump's eligibility in Michigan filed an appeal to that state Supreme Court just on Monday. So there is a potential ripple effect here. And, you know, I wonder what you think about that and also what you think about it being this court. This court that doesn't seem to have much respect for precedent but calls itself originalist, its majority does, its conservative majority does, and a court that has a member whose wife, (laughs) whose wife materially participated in the insurrection and who probably won't recuse himself. Clarence Thomas's wife, I mean. Yeah. I I mean, (laughs) if the Supreme Court were to affirm this ruling— he could be disqualified, not just in Colorado, but in but in multiple states. And so, like the stakes, the stakes couldn't be higher. Um, as you say, they define themselves as originalists. What does originalism means? It means it's a. I mean, my <laughs> layman's take on it is that it's a fairy tale. But <laughs> if you listen to the way that Fair. they talk about it, it's that there's no interpretation. Essentially, that all of all they are doing is applying the language of the Constitution as the people who wrote that language intended it in their own time. Again, I think it is kind of a fairy tale, but that's the way they talk about it themselves. In the case of the 14th Amendment, this was written in 1868 specifically to preclude people from holding office in the United States if they were pre- if they had engaged <laughs> in trying to overthrow the government of the United States or if Hello. they had previously been office holders who violated that oath. Um, and so it's, I mean, if you, I look at that as a person who doesn't agree with this originalism fantasy the, the legal philosophy, and I say, well, seems pretty clear to me. But <laughs> you, you and I know, and every you know, every realistic observer of this Supreme Court knows um, that they're not they're not given to um, grand gestures in any direction other than a right wing direction. They are willing yeah. to do even very radical things. They're willing to take up cases where the fact, the purported facts of the case aren't real. <laughs> they're willing to take up cases <laughs> where they're supposedly governed by precedent and just decide that precedent doesn't apply anymore in this case because they have a new feeling. I mean, they're willing to do incredibly radical thing in the service of conservative policy aims. And I think it could be argued partisan aims of the Republican Party. They have not been willing to do anything brave in any decision other in any direction other than that and so will the United States Supreme Court say this is what the this is what the authors of the 14th Amendment were talking about in 1868 when they put section 3 in there I cannot imagine it but um, you know I, I, at this point, stranger things have happened, Joy. You know, we've str- lived through a lot, you and I. Who knows? <laughs> stranger things have happened literally since, like, yesterday. Like, everything's strange every day. But, you know, I, I want to just hinge on one more thing. I, I, I don't want to make it a hostage situation, but I do love talking with you. Uh, the part about them being Republicans, because one of, to me, kind of the things that you can sort of predict about this Supreme Court is that they, that the, the Supreme Court majority, the conservative majority, is that they will hew to outcomes that the politi- that the Republican political party would prefer. Yes. And I think you and I both know from, you know, whatever they say publicly, one of the outcomes that the Republican party would prefer is no more Trump is to rid themselves of this man because he has taken control of the party, he has taken control of their base, and he has taken control of their minds. They're not allowed to use them anymore unless they use them for whatever it is that makes him feel good that day. In a sense, the Supreme Court Republican majority, if we want to call them that, has an opportunity to rid their preferred party 
of this person based on the thing that everyone understands was a threat to our democracy and the peaceful transfer of power. Can you foresee John Roberts and friends taking up that opportunity? I probably couldn't foresee Clarence Thomas doing it, but I don't know. Are there five of them who might? I, I honestly, I don't know. And this is actually one of those moments um, in journalism where, you know, there's a, there's a lot of criticism, and a lot of it deserved, um, for what we call access journalism, right, for people who really know their subjects. Um, or for people who are, I think there's a, there's a lot of criticism that is less warranted for journalists who are really, really, like, deep earthworms in one particular beat. <laughs> but this is one of those moments when people who really know the Supreme Court, not just as lawyers or ex-lawyers, but people who know these justices and who know the the way these justices interact and who know these justices in terms of the way they think about politics and their legacy and ethics and all of those things. Journalism about the court um, and about this court and about these justices is about to get very, very hot <laughs> and very important. Those are going to be there. Those people's phones are burning up right now. Um, I think that, that that dynamic that you raise is a real one, Joy. And I do think the justices want us not to think of them as political actors, but I think we understand that they are, and I think they have politics um, that are in some ways quite discernible for some of them and some of the others. It's a little cryptic, but how do they feel about Donald Trump as the head of the Republican Party becomes a very, very hot question right now.